Let's start off, Stephen, uh, with a look at uh, one comment that you made saying, I have been an unflinching optimist on the Chinese economy for 25 years. I'm no, now more concerned than at any point in my career as a China watcher. What makes you so worried in particular? Well, I think the, the, the biggest thing, uh, Richard, is that my optimism for 25 years has been based uh, largely on uh, an analytical, analytically sound case for economic development and rebalancing. <clears throat> uh, and uh, under Xi Jinping, the approach has shifted away from the analytics of uh, consumer-led, services-led rebalancing to more of a ideological uh, approach that's wrapped around uh, the strength of his personality. And that's a very different development philosophy than the one that has been so successful in um, delivering uh, 40 years of spectacular growth uh, in uh, the Chinese economy. Uh, and there's a number of specific headwinds, whether they're demographic, deleveraging, uh, property, uh, the regulatory pressures on um, you know, private sector, internet platform companies, common prosperity, uh, the whole productivity issue in China uh, that, that make this new approach uh, far more problematic than anything uh, that led me to conclude uh, that China was unstoppable in the past. So, yeah, yeah I'm worried. And, and it seems like it's almost... Uh, two certain types of policies that are kind of butting heads is it's COVID zero and reaching a f around five and a half percent growth target. And when you see economists continue to slash their forecast left and right, if in fact China cannot reach that growth target or at least abandon it, is this a sign that Xi Jinping is losing his grip on power in some way? Politically, what does this mean for him? Well, yeah, look, he's got a strong grip on power. We, we all know that. There's a lot of speculation in the West without any real concrete evidence to support it that, uh, you know, he's in trouble uh, going into the 20th Party Congress. But, um, you know, the, the growth target for this year, 5.5%, forget it. I mean, it'll be a miracle if China hits 4. Uh, and uh, there are many... Uh, forecasters that I've seen that are now flirting with cutting their numbers uh, below three. Uh, and, and so uh, the, the COVID zero policy uh, is not appropriate uh, when you have a highly uh, transmissible variant, uh, as we see now with, with various um, uh, signs of um, Omicron spreading in Europe. Once again, we're having another wave in the United States. Uh, Shanghai is not Wuhan. Uh, and the Wuhan model worked uh, because it was a totally different uh, variant. And, you know, with spillover effects evident in Beijing and most likely in, in other large cities, uh, China's just going to go from one zero COVID induced locked down to another. And, um, you know, this is an unsustainable uh, approach to managing a public health crisis in any country. Steve, if we, if we look at the employer, today's PMI numbers, which again show this contraction on both the services and the manufacturing side, and you delve into it and you look at the employment component, that reads for even more depressing reading. And now, that's very important uh, given what's going on because of COVID zero and its repercussions. It must be hugely worrisome for China's social stability. And there are other reasons to be worried there as well. Well, uh, good point, uh, Richard. Uh, one of the first things I learned, um, you know, in my uh, uh, early days as a China watcher is that social stability is everything. And when you have an employment problem, um, that's what shapes and drives Chinese economic policy uh, above anything else. And unemployment's on the rise. It's uh, on the rise for uh, migrant workers due to uh, 
lockdown related um, uh, uh, pressures in, uh, in supply chains. Uh, and it's, um, it, it's up for significantly for college graduates uh, due to these regulatory pressures bearing down on China's most dynamic private sector uh, uh, company. So, you know, yeah. this is a serious problem. And I wanted to get to your book as well, Accidental Conflict, uh, when it comes to the relationship between U.S. and China. Uh, first of all, why is it accidental, you, you, you say? And do you think with China warming up with ties with Russia, how big of a risk is that geopolitically? Well, it's an accidental conflict because it's it's based on a, uh, a clash of false narratives that both nations have with respect uh, to, to each other. Uh, the United States blames China for its uh, trade deficit when its savings problem gives it trade deficits with uh, 106 countries. Uh, mm -hmm. China blames uh, America for uh, containing its growth and limiting its rebalancing when it's afraid to take the tough steps it needs to take uh, to rebalance its economy. So these false impressions collide with one another and they create a conflict uh, that in, in many respects uh, is, is based on false premises. It did not have to happen. It's interesting to see um, uh, leading Chinese officials saying that uh, uh, China can't afford to see the, the U.S. Uh, relationship deteriorate uh, any further. And yet, as you just said, uh, here's China with a now unlimited new partnership uh, with uh, a pariah state, uh, the Russian Federation. Steve.